Okay, hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this seventh session in, of introduction to general Mahajana Buddhism and the Chinese Puritan School. Um, I hope that this, uh, these Dharma shedding sessions are uh, of some benefit to you. Uh, remember that this seventh session is will be the last one from this uh, in this year. We will resume on the week of the seventh of January. We'll uh, will be away uh, with family for some time, but uh, this uh, this will be the the last session for for this year. But uh, I'm really grateful for your for your presence for your interventions. And uh, I deeply hope that these Dharma sharing sessions, uh, uh, you know, benefit you in some way and teach you uh, about the basics of the Buddha Dharma. And hopefully, once we start to talk about the Pure Land Buddhism in the Chinese Pure Land School, uh, you will be able to to have a, a, a very good grasp and to improve your 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 practice and your understanding and your appreciation of, for uh, Mahayana Buddhism and the Chinese uh, Pure Land School of the Thirteen Patriarchs. So uh, let's continue uh, with our with our exposition of um, the three pillars of Buddhist practice. Last time we were uh, talking about just to make a summary of last last class. We were talking about the four novel the four noble realms. According to Mahayana Buddhism, there are the uh, the teaching of the ten realms. So we have the six realms of samsaric existence. You know, hells, hungry goats, animals, human beings, asuras uh, or demigods, uh, gods. So we have all the six realms of existence, and then we have the realms of uh, disciples, of beings who have uh, been liberated from samsara through Buddhist practice, but there are four uh, grades. We have Arhats, Prajeka Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and Buddhas. We explain those differences between them. Basically, Arhats and Prajeka Buddhas still don't have Bodhicitta, or the, the body mind, which is the, <clears throat> the attitude or mental uh, or heart, you know, disposition or determination to save all sentient beings from suffering. So they don't study the Dharma for the sake of all beings, but only to liberate themselves from suffering. Yes, which is it's not bad, but it's, let's say it's incomplete. It's not complete still, yes? Then we have Bodhisattvas, who are beings who are the direct disciples of uh, the Buddhas, the Ten Directions of the Universe. And they also uh, practice the Dharma, but from the very beginning, for them, uh, they have the bodhicitta. Maybe there were arhats before or Prajeka Buddha, but they decided to, to to study the Dharma not only for themselves, but for the sake of all sentient beings. So that, that puts them in a in a in a whole different category altogether because they have bodhicitta. They have the body mind, the body heart. Then we have Buddhas, yes, which are the, the pinnacle of all the spiritual accomplishments or attainments in the universe, which is Anuttara Samjak Sambodhi or Supreme unsurpassed enlightenment. This is the, the level of a uh, Buddha, no? So, uh, Buddhas, to, be, to become a Buddha is the objective of Buddhism. Yes. It sounds like rather simple, because the objective of Buddhism is to become a Buddha. This is, this is what we are aiming for, yes. uh, to have perfect wisdom, perfect compassion, and to have all of the transcendental skills to benefit sentient beings. Mm -hmm. Or more, more, more of that uh, later. So we talked a little bit about Amitabha Buddha's Pure Land. Just a little introduction, just to make you aware that above samsara, it's not like like you escape samsara and you are like in nothingness, or like you are you are like dead or something. No, actually, there is a lot of life outside uh, samsara. It's like a frog. No, the, I, I think this was Yawan or a, 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 another friend of mine told me this this uh, analogy, the fable of a, of a frog. So imagine you are a frog and you live inside a well and everything you know uh, from birth to coming from cradle to grave is just the well, the darkness of the well, the, the fact that it is like damp, uh, it has water, you, you don't have so much sunlight. Yes, yeah. 
you don't know about the trees and the wind and the mountains outside and, and the sun. You only maybe get some glimpses here and there. So then comes a bird and, he te- and she tells you, oh, there's a whole world outside. Yes. So maybe the frog can see the sky and says, whoa. So, the, so that sky that I see, that little hole is the sky. No, that, that is just, so the bird says, that's just a, a tiny, tiny part of the sky. Once you get out of, uh, of this well, you will be able to see. So, so this is the point here, that be above samsara, we find many uh, realms of existence, and these realms are not, are not inside the cycle of reincarnation. They are emanated by the power of the Buddhas, yes, which... Uh, on the on the contrary, is I mean, un- unlike sentient beings who are trapped in sansara, who emanate the worlds they inhabit due to ignorance, according to their own mental limitations, pure lands are emanated with, with that unlimited heart, with a pure heart, with a pure mind, with limitless compassion and wisdom. These are the the worlds that are inhabited by Buddhas and their disciples. Okay, so this is an example of uh, you know. This is Amitabha Buddha's Pure Land, Mitabalokiteshvara, Mahastama Prapta, his two main bodhisattvas, Kwanjin Pusa and Daichi, Daichishi Pusa. So, um, so the Pure Lands are the exact, let's say, I don't want to say opposite, but it's very, they're very different from Samsara. Yes. If, if, if in Samsara we find sorrow, we find lamentations and lack of wisdom, and it is very difficult to practice the Dharma, in the Pure Land, practicing the Dharma is natural. Every, everybody that is born there, I mean, you can see here, they are completely dedicated to studying the Dharma, to learning from, Shaki, from, from Amitabha Buddha, from all Buddhas in the universe. So they experience Dharma joy all the time. So you, you, you could say Pure Lands are very different from Heavens. Sometimes people see Pure Lands and they think, oh, that is like Heaven. But no, Heavens are actually quite low level because Heavens, where you go there, most of Heavens, like, by some, some, there are so, some exceptions, but most Heavens are not uh, designed to, to, to learn. You go there to experience uh, extreme pleasures and those pleasures are often intoxicating to your mind. They can actually lead you astray and cause you to be born in the lower realms in the long run. So, Pure Lands are quite different. It's more like a school, like a university where you go to learn. Where you go to learn with joy. So they are also quite beautiful. And they are not only institutions. This is only an analogy for convenience. But these are, these are actually universities, but they are whole worlds. Uh, it's a whole world system. It's a whole universe there. Okay. And it's filled, filled with beauty, transcendental wisdom, compassion. You have the best companions there, great bodhisattvas uh, from all over the, the universe. And you also have Amitabha Buddha. Uh, and uh, you have access to all the pure lands, to all the teachings. And you can devote your entire existence to becoming a Buddha. And you will uh, become a Buddha in Amitabha Buddha's pure land quite rapidly. Okay. But of course, we are not touching this subject. This is only to, to let you know that there is something outside samsara that is very worthwhile, uh, worth seeing, worth experiencing. You know? All right. So uh, uh, in, in our last session, we concluded that our objective in the Buddha Dharma is to go from here to there, from, from a place of limitation, a place of suffering, yes, from realms, the six realms of samsaric existence, hells, hungry ghosts, animals, humans, demigods or asuras, and celestial beings. So our idea is not to go from here to there, but to go from all of this, which is kind of like a a limited uh, prison, let's say, to the freedom, the freedom of nirvana, the freedom of being born in the pure lands, in the enlightened realms, okay? So this is the freedom. Also, the, this could be interpreted as the freedom of the heart. You, know? you are free uh, from all the limitations in samsara. Okay? This is our true nature. It's not like we are trying to build something out of, out of the blue. Our true nature, according to Buddhism, and this is something that we will examine, in, I think, in, uh, in the next session, will be the Buddha nature, or the self nature, the true nature of all sentient beings is total freedom, compassion, wisdom. All right?
And so we also talked about a little bit about why beings are trapped in samsara. And we, we went to the, and the famous analogy that the Buddha provided, which is the analogy of the arrow. Yes, uh, it's like we are uh, asking the wrong, wrong questions. You know, if we are hit by an arrow and this arrow is poisoned, we need to get it to remove it as soon as possible. We need to ask medical assistance. But if instead we, we start to ask like questions such as, oh, the, uh, wh wh where did the arrow come from? Who hit, uh, who, who, who threw the arrow to me? I mean, uh, what is the material that the arrow is made of? What is the origin of the arrow? Then you will be dead in no time. You will lose your, this precious human body in no time. So that is not the question. Those are not the questions that we should be asking. So the Buddha said, even if you knew the, the origin of the universe, even if I talk to you about, about it, and of course, Buddhas know about all of this. This is expressed in the Tantras, in the esoteric Sutras. Uh, this is expressed in many, many, uh, you know, specialized teachings of the Buddha, especially, especially in the esoteric lineages, in Vajrayana and stuff. So, but the Buddha... They decided not to talk about this with all people. Actually, for the majority of people, these, these topics are not to be spoken about because they could confuse people. So they, he always spoke about the fact that we need to exit samsara. Okay? So exit samsara is to remove the arrow. What, what is the arrow? Is the arrow of birth, the arrow of uh, death, the arrow of suffering. This is something that is inside our hearts right now. It's like poison. So we need to remove it. Yes. We don't need to concern ourselves so much with the origin of the poison, with the characteristics of the poison. That is, that is for later. For now, we, need to, we have something very clear. We need to exit samsara as soon as possible and become Buddhas. Once we will become Buddhas, and once we go to the Pure Lands, uh, then we will be able to study uh, as much as we want, and, you, and we, will be, we, we will be able to penetrate all the mysteries of the universe, and uh, we will enjoy it, and we will be benefited benefited from it we, we will be able to profit from our studies and from our spiritual realizations and we will be able to benefit sentient beings with that but for now we, ha we have a very thorough uh, let's say very simple task in hand simple in the sense but not easy it's simple in the sense that we need to exit yes whereas we whether we exit it or not depends on our level of cultivation and our uh, uh, dharma door yes which is why we choose uh, to go to Amitabha Buddha's Pure Land because we, we recognize that we are not up to the task for, of doing it for ourselves. We need the assistance of Amitabha Buddha. Okay? So this is just a summary from, from the last session. So today we're going to examine two topics, uh, maybe three topics, let's say, for the Four Noble Truths, which includes, of course, in the Fourth Noble Truth, uh, the, eightfold, no, the Noble Eightfold Path, um, which is uh, the fourth noble truth. And then we will examine a little bit uh, the 12 links of dependent origination and, and another topic which is related to that, which are the 12 transcendental links of dependent origination, with, uh, origination which are not so much thought about. And this is also resonates with the uh, Mahayana teachings. No? We will talk about that later. So, uh, the Buddha is like a doctor. No? He administers the medicine of the Buddha Dharma, which is based on three pillars. Okay? There are many ways to, to, to make categories in the Buddha Dharma. This is just one way. This is not the only one. But uh, morality, meditation, and wisdom are like three very important aspects of the Buddha Dharma. Morality, of course, comprises uh, the five precepts or the other precepts. Uh, uh, or talks about ethics and the fact that we need to be very mindful of our mind, uh, of, of what we say, of what we do, and to have pure intentions. You know? If we don't have morality, it would be very difficult to advance in the Buddha Dharma. This is for sure. I mean, if you don't have uh, like uh, even basic morality, you, you, you don't try to become a better, a better person, yes. if you don't try to, to have a pure heart, it would be very difficult to study the Dharma because once, uh, if you have, a, let's say, a, a dark mind, a mind that is like, like complacent and lazy and you don't want to improve yourself, then even if you read all the sutras in the world, you won't be able to understand them because your heart won't resonate with the, with the energy of the Buddhas. 
what is the energy of the Buddhas? It's an energy of peace, compassion, wisdom. Yes. And if you want to understand the Dharma, we have to we have to commence. We have to start by looking at our own actions yes, and try to, even if we cannot be perfect, and of course we will commit mistakes, we need to be able to develop some level, basic level of morality. Yes, Don't speak vulgar words. Don't hit others. Don't use violence. Yes, try to refrain from evil speech. Try to, try to refrain from evil thoughts. Even if you are not able, you can still try. And Buddhas, we will be able to see that you are actually trying to improve yes and this is very valuable then we have uh, meditation yes uh, and this is this varies from school to uh, from from school to school in buddhism there are many ways to meditate but nevertheless all schools all the different lineages in buddhism have some form of meditation some form of contemplative practice could be visualizations could be nianfo could be sasen in chan could be uh, the elaborate uh, spiritual rituals in Vajrayana could be Vipassana, Shamata, you name it. But it's a, there is a meditation element, yes, or Bhavana, yes. Uh, this is uh, mental cultivation, mental cultivation, okay? Samadhi, yes, so to attain levels of med meditative attainments. Then we have wisdom. So through morality and wisdom, then we develop the fruit of meditation and morality, which is wisdom. Wisdom is not only a meditation, but also to, to have conclusions, yes, to, to know what you have learned and to apply, to apply the knowledge of the Buddha Dharma in your daily life. For that, you know, it's, it's not only knowledge. Knowledge is very easy to acquire. When you go to Wikipedia, I, mean, I don't know, you can read all the books in the world. That is only knowledge. It's only information level. But wisdom is quite different. Wisdom is something that comes from your own heart, something that comes from your own practice. Yes. And this is something that cannot be improvised. You need to work for it. Yes, there is not a secret formula here. You need to practice the Dharma uh, according to the Dharma, as the Buddha says. You know? Practice the Dharma as it has been prescribed by the Buddha. It's like a doctor. The doctor gives you the medicine, but it depends on you whether you take the medicine according to the, instru the, the instructions of the doctor or if you, I don't know, to, to you play around with the medicine. Okay? If, you, if you are provided a medicine by a doctor and you play with it, and you don't, you know, you, you don't take the medicine when you are supposed to take it, then you will be, uh, you know, uh, harming yourself even. It could be actually be detrimental, even lethal. Yes. So if we take the medicine of the Buddha Dharma, we should, uh, by all means, try to take it in the, in the manner in which ha each ha in, in, the, in the manner in which it has been prescribed by the doctor. And who is the doctor? The Buddha. Yes. And the prescriptions are in the sutras are in the commentaries of the patriarchs. Okay, so uh, of course, there are many, many teachings in the Buddha Dharma. These are very basic teachings that uh, were taught by, by the Buddha. And this applies also for all Buddhists. I think the, it's very important to know the Four Noble Truths. Yes, this, this is part of the Arahat path. But it, it also applies to Mahayana Buddhism because in Mahayana Buddhism, we are also taught not to be attached. Yes, also to remove the causes of suffering. This is very, very fundamental teaching of the Buddha Dharma. So there are four noble truths. We have the truth of suffering, the truth of the origin of suffering, the truth of the end or the cessation of suffering, and the noble eightfold path, which is the path that leads to the cessation of suffering. These are the four noble truths. So remember when, the, uh, remember when we studied in... In session one, the Shakyamuni Buddha story, you remember when, when he attained enlightenment and he went to, to his former companions, these five ascetics, uh, the first thing he did was to provide the three refuges to him, uh, to them. And he talked about the middle way. He talked about the fact that you cannot attain enlightenment by, by extreme practices, not to torture the body, not to indulge in uh, sensual desires to walk the middle way. And he also taught about this. He says, uh, the four noble truths are the way out of suffering. Yes. So it's a, it's a, it's a very fundamental teaching for the mind. No? It's uh, something that is applicable to all our lives. So the truth of suffering. So what is suffering? Okay. 
sometimes people uh, they, they they think that suffering is, is just like oh i don't know like a toothache or like body or mind suffering but it's it, it is more it's deeper than that it's way deeper according to the buddha dharma suffering uh, includes all uh, the suffering of mental phenomena all the suffering that comes from the body and all the suffering of birth and death in the cycle of reincarnation okay and also eight mundane sufferings which are you know birth old age illness death separation what it, from what is pleasant to encounter with what is unpleasant not obtaining what one wants and the suffering associated with the physical and mental elements that make up one's vehicle in birth and samsara so that is this the five skandhas yes which are feeling uh, perception uh, memory consciousness and uh, a mind no? and uh, sorry feelings perceptions uh, memories consciousness and the body no the, the, the elements of the physical body the rupa yes uh, but the, we can understand it in a very simple way this is just the all the physical and mental elements can cause suffering and why why is that it's because samsara and our bodies are caused not by pure karma but by impure karma so that is why our bodies are not so conducive yes, to, to wisdom. They can conduce to wisdom if we have that attitude, but our bodies and our minds uh, are constantly aching. If, for example, if you sit in a chair, yes, I mean, you, you sit on a chair for a while, then you will experience suffering in short time. That is why when you sit in front of a, of a person or you are like maybe drinking coffee, you will be you will notice that you will change positions all the time why because you are suffering yes sometimes people don't remember this they think oh yeah sitting in a, in a shed is so good but actually sitting on a shed is actually revealing the nature of samsara it's revealing that everything that we do causes suffering to a lesser or higher extent okay uh, this is something to reflect upon it means that our body is a source of a lot of sufferings okay Okay, that is not to say that we should reject the body. I mean, the Buddha was very wise. He also used the body to attain enlightenment, to reflect upon the body. So we should see the, the suffering in samsara as the fuel for wisdom. Not to reject it, but to understand it. That there, there's just that. Okay, But of course, we need to recognize the limitations. We need to recognize the, the, the deep limitations of our body, of our current body and mind. Okay, so uh, the suffering exists. So birth... The suffering of birth. Let's examine this. What is the suffering of birth? Uh, have you ever wondered, uh, like truly pondered upon the fact that we are born in this world and when we are born, we are born crying? Yes. Uh, so, I mean, we don't need to get melodramatic about it, but just examine the fact that when babies are born, uh, the majority of them are born uh, with blood uh, and they are born crying. Yes, it's very traumatic to be born. Actually, according to modern psychology, this is something like it's like a basic trauma that all beings have. Because when we're, when they are born, they are removed from from your house. I mean, your house is your mother's belly. Yes, your mother's womb, and there you lived in darkness, and you lived there. You lived like very very secure. Um, maybe it was not perfect, but we were accustomed to that. But when you are taken out from your mother's womb is quite traumatic yes this is the first time you breathe uh, then you experience all of these strange people around you uh, then you experience these lights and then you are I mean, then your your lungs are filled with air for the first time uh, then you're you, you feel cold i mean imagine that it's, it's, <laughs> it's like someone take it's like it's like an invisible hand would take us from now and then takes us to, to another dimension where there is ether and who knows what. And it, I mean, that, that would be quite traumatic, isn't it, for us now? Imagine that for a baby. So being born is not fun at all. Sometimes people try to, to say, oh, yeah, being born is good. Uh, maybe it is good if you practice wisdom during your life. But the, 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 the precise moment of, of being born has a lot of suffering. And we can actually see that. If we, we if we see it with an honest mind, we can see that a baby so is suffering from day one, is crying. Yes, okay, uh, okay. Then we have uh, old age. So the first need, the first thing we need to age is to be born. If we are born, then we will age and we will die. So birth and death are not separated. 
Yes, sometimes people don't like to be reminded of this, but the Buddha was very clear about it. Okay, when beings are born, then they start to die. Yes, because death and birth are just two sides of the same reality. You know? Birth and death. So our bodies, uh, not only do they ache, not only do they like bother us sometimes. Ah, I need to go to the bathroom. I need to to do this, to do that. I need to. They sweat. Yes, they they are not so comfortable at all. Yes. Uh, but not only that, they will also fade away and they will also die. And it would be very painful, okay? For most people, of course, if we don't practice the Dharma, we, will, we won't have a way to overcome the, those final sufferings. But the truth is, even for experienced and seasoned practitioners, the dying is, can, also, can, can often be challenging, yes? That is also one of the reasons why I chose to practice Pure Land Buddhism, because this is a specialized not only in life, it gives you quality of life, but also provides you with the best opportunity when you live this physical existence to go to a better place, to go to Amitabha Buddha's Pure Land. Uh, and this is a very important practice in all Mahayana Buddhism. Because we acknowledge as Buddhists that dying is a very serious matter. It's very serious. Why? Well, consider that our mind is not mortal. Our body is mortal, but our mind can carry on. Our mind can continue to create the same mistakes. And where will it lead us? Where will it, uh, you know, drive us? It can drive us to a, a good birth, to a bad rebirth, but it can drive us to samsara or to nirvana. What do we want? Yes, we have an, an eternal heart, an eternal mind. Yes, the nature of that eternity depends on our level of cultivation. Do we want to suffer? Or do we want to be happy? Yes, that is a very simple question of the Buddha Dharma. And the, and the Buddha taught us that we cannot continue to be happy inside samsara. We cannot ex expect realistically to be happy uh, permanently, even if we are born as a god or as a human being with wealth and beauty, that will fade away like a dream. So, illness. So not only do we age, we also get sick during life. Uh, we can reflect upon this, yes. Maybe I haven't, myself, at least for myself, I haven't suffered so much illnesses, but I have witnessed uh, for my friends and for some relatives what illness can do to the mind and to the heart, you know. I mean, an illness is not something like, yeah, yeah, I get sick. But some people, when they get sick, they can also get depressed. They can also lose their appetite. They can actually become a burden for their families. So actually illness, as the Buddha said in the Lalita Vistara Sutra, he said, that illness is, uh, humili humiliates sentient beings, yes? He, he compared illness like with the rays of the sun in a desert, yes? It actually destroys sentient beings, illness. So illness is, is something that we should take at heart. We should reflect upon illness. We should see that actually illness is something uh, quite tremendous, especially for people who have uh, very serious illnesses, like for example, cancer, like for example, I don't know, Alzheimer's, uh, I mean, uh, try to count the illnesses. And actually, the Buddha does this with exquisite accuracy. In, in some of the sutras, the Buddha talks about all the different illnesses. And he says, there are illnesses for the eye. There are illnesses that attack the brain. There are illnesses that attack the stomach. There are illnesses that attack your knees, your feet. I mean, there are illnesses for all, all the body. <laughs> Sometimes we forget that. We think, oh, yes, we get ill. But have you ever wondered? all of the illnesses, and all, the, all of their variety, variety, and the fact that we will die from illness, okay? Even if we die from old age, it's not like we die from old age and that's it. No, we will get sick eventually, okay? So it's something to examine as well, okay? Not, not, not in a, of course, I, I don't want to scare you in a melodramatic way, like a, like a telenovela or something. <laughs> oh, yes, we're going to die. <laughs> I mean, it's not like that. But do it with wisdom, yes, with equanimity and peace. Just examine. Examine our condition with a pure heart. Yeah? Examine your condition with a scientific, yes, an inquiry mind as the Buddha. The Buddha always taught people like in a very logical way, in a philosophical manner. He said, okay, just look at your body. Look at your mind. Do you think, yes, you can find happiness in, in, in this body, in this mind? Huh? Okay. Then we have a separation from what is pleasant. Hmm. So this is the one, two, third, three, four, fifth, the fifth uh, suffering of the human realm. This is also, also applies to all samsara. 
So what is separation from what is pleasant? So even if we find everything our heart seeks, yes, wealth, beauty, a partner, a family, uh, all of those things will be taken from us. Taken by whom? Yes. By our enemy, no. By just by the law of impermanence, and the law of impermanence, impermanence is not a god. It's not like like someone wants to get revenge. No, it's just in the way of the universe. Yes, what comes to what comes to existence would eventually fade away. All conditioned phenomena are impermanent. Right? This is something that the Buddha constantly says. All conditioned phenomena, are like a dream, they fade away. They are not substantial. This is something that we need to remember, I think, every day. I, at least for myself, I know that I need to remind myself of this every day. This is why the Dharma, and this is something that I want to express, I want to convey to you. The Dharma is not mundane knowledge. It's not like something, oh, yes, I know about this. and you. No, the Dharma is something that you need to uh, ponder and to reflect upon every day and to practice. Yes, practice. In our case, practice Nienfo with a full uh, awareness of impermanence and of suffering in the world, okay? This is very, very, very wise. And if we uh, encounter something that we like, yes, we, we need to remind ourselves that when we, even if we need to value it, like, for example, relatives, husband, wife, that is good. It's not like we need to, I don't know, uh, I don't know, curse it or, or, or don't appreciate it. We, we can enjoy it. We can appreciate it. But nevertheless, we should acknowledge that there is a deep, you know, there is something deeper than these, uh, than these pleasures, than these joys. And we need to remind ourselves that eventually they will fade away. They will not last. So we need to put our mind and our hearts to the task of looking for something that will not fade away. Okay. What will not fade away? Our heart nature, our true heart, our Buddha nature, Nirvana. In our case, as Pure Land Buddhists, uh, we attempt to go to Amitabha Buddha's Pure Land, where you know, we know that it's eternal and it is, in it is in accordance with our self nature, with our Buddha nature, which is according to the sutras, eternal, blissful. Yeah? We will examine that in future sessions, you know? the, the concept of self nature or Buddha nature in Mahayana Buddhism. Okay? But if we, try, if we try to look for this happiness outside ourselves, we will, all, we will always fail. Yes, because true happiness doesn't come from without, it doesn't come from outside, but from within. It comes from our true nature. Yes, it comes from uh, the Dharmakaya, it comes from the supreme reality, which is beyond name and form, which is beyond, uh, you know, change and suffering. Okay, so then we have not obtaining what one wants. So if we have projects, sometimes people have, you know, they define their lives. For example, they want to attain something. They, maybe they want to open a business. Yes. Even, even opening a temple itself, it doesn't matter how noble it is. Yes. Even, I don't know, our deepest desires, no matter how noble, if we are attached to those desires, we are going to suffer. Why? Because things don't go the way we want. This is not a conspiracy. This is just the way things are. Yes. If we, if we put a lot of energy into a project and maybe it doesn't turn out as, as we want it, yes, we can suffer, okay? And even if, if, if our wildest desires, if our deepest desires are fulfilled and we have what we want, then eventually we will lose it. Why? Because nothing is permanent in samsara. That is the thing. Our mind is constantly trying to trick us to desire things that are outside our heart nature because this is an habitual tendency that we need to overcome. That is why the Buddha uh, refused and overcame his desire you know, uh, to palaces, to the throne. Of course, he, he was making a demonstration for us. He was already enlightened, but he decided to abandon his palace. Why? Because he's, he knew that even if you have all the money in the world, all the fame, yes, all the sex you want, all the drug, I don't know, maybe for nowadays drugs or maybe uh, um, alcohol, no, intoxicants. These things do not bring happiness. Maybe they can make you feel like, like alive yes, for, for some hours, but they won't uh, allow you to attain true happiness and true peace. Actually, they will create the opposite. They will create misery. They will create 
eventually your own demise, your own uh, the destruction of your own uh, aspirations. No, so it's it's very important to remind ourselves that whatever we want, we need to do it with a pure heart, with a still heart, and we we shouldn't get attached to to phenomena. Okay, this is very important, and this is stressed by the Buddha in many sutras. Yes. For example, in the Diamond Sutra, in the Heart Sutra, you should always be very mindful not to attach to uh, conditioned phenomena. Okay. Mm. Then we have uh, the suffering associated with the physical and mental elements that make up one's vehicle of birth in samsara. This is something that I have already mentioned. Our body is constantly aching. Our mind is constantly I don't know, uh, going from one thought to the next, uh, we, we, we realize that our body and our mind, maybe uh, we cannot find true happiness in our ordinary body and mind. Why? Because they are also conditioned phenomena. Yes, they change. Our body is constantly, you know, uh, looking for food, for, for drink. Yes. It's asking us to, uh, I don't know, go to the bathroom to, to have uh, different necessities met. You know? You have the temperature. We, if we live in countries where there is extreme weather, our bodies also tend to suffer. Uh, just consider all the all, all the different ways in which our body can suffer. Yes, through temperature, to illnesses, uh, just sitting on a chair yes, can be a cause of suffering. So if we acknowledge that, we will realize that there is no need to be attached to the to our human body. Yes, we need to. Uh, to have a, a peaceful heart that is not dependent on the body to be happy. Sometimes I see a lot of magazines nowadays for men and for both men and women. And we all, all, all we see in these magazines is beautiful people, you know, makeup, you know, fashion. Um, I mean, that's okay. Yes, if people, I mean, we should respe respect people's choices. But nevertheless, we should ponder upon the fact that they are, it's not realistic what they are looking for. It's not realistic to, to try to be happy with your body all your life. Yes. Uh, for example, there is a famous, a famous celebrity in my country. And this woman is almost 70 years old. And you look at her and she looks like a 40 year old woman. She's quite beautiful. And many people admire her in my country. Yes. And I, I have nothing against her. But when I look at her, I say, Eventually, no matter how, how, how well she does, she is going to abandon that physical body. And she has invested millions, millions of, I don't know, maybe dollars in that body, in, in treatments, in creams. I mean, imagine all of the effort that she has put on her body. Yes. All of those hours in the gym. Uh, but eventually she will need to abandon that. And, and, and even if she, if she tells me that she's not attached to that body, I, tell, I, I, will, I would tell her. Look all the effort you have put on that body. Yes, you are you are seriously attached to your physical image. So what will you do once you abandon that physical body? So remember, our bodies are like 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 clothes. Yes, once they get dirty, once they are not uh, enough to carry our consciousness, then we will abandon that vehicle. It's the vehicle, and this vehicle we should take care of it. We should wash it. We should maybe appreciate it, maybe do exercise, but that's it. Yes, we shouldn't get too much attached to this body. It's like, it's like you go to an hotel. So go to the hotel and try not to be messy, but remember you will abandon that hotel room, okay? So this is very important to, to remember, okay? So this is all, when, when we say suffering in Buddhism, is you say that. Sometimes people nowadays, when they see the first noble truth, they go, oh, suffering, ah, that's it, I get it, but no. It's, it's, it's way, way more deeper than that. And it's something that has all of these different uh, facets, you know, these eight points, the eight sufferings that the Buddha talked about in his discourses on the first noble truth, the truth of suffering. Second, the origin of suffering, you know, so samudaya. The origin of, origin of suffering, or suffering is attachment desire to mental states, situations, people, objects, desire for phenomena, okay? No matter how noble the phenomena. The Buddha didn't talk about the, uh, of this, but if you, if you are attached to things inside samsara, to body, to minds, to mental states, to things that are impermanent, 
then you will suffer. Yes, this is actually that makes uh, something that makes a lot of sense if you think about it. If things are by nature insatisfactory, yes, they don't stay the same. So we cannot say they are identified forever as something. Yes, like for example, I don't know if you have a chair it's made of wood. Eventually, it will transform into wood again. Just not not, not a chair, but just a piece of wood there. So we cannot say that something is permanently something. We cannot say that it's, it's like trying to call an, a, a nice figure and we say, okay, this is a, like a dog. This is like a person, yes? But eventually it will be transformed into water. Eventually it will be transformed just in its elemental, uh, you know, nature, which is uh, just a physical element there. It, it, it is not substantial. So we shouldn't be attached to uh, specific phenomena, okay? This is very important. So once we recognize that the cause of suffering is something that we are doing to ourselves, then this gives us power. This is very important for you to, to, to acknowledge. It's not like the Buddha is talking about like a depressing philosophy, like, oh, everything is impermanent. And sometimes people say, oh, no, Buddha, you are so like, it's, not, it's like pessimistic, but it's not pessimistic. It's actually very luminous and beautiful. You will see why. Yes, because once we recognize what we are not, what actually causes uh, suffering, we will realize that we have the power to abandon it and to have something much better instead, which is nirvana, which is our Buddha nature, which is blissful, peaceful by nature. Yes, but the same way that we have a room filled with all kind of, kinds of garbage, once we remove this garbage, we will realize the, na the pure nature of the room, the pure nature of our mind and hearts. Huh? So we shouldn't be looking for mental states. We shouldn't be looking for situations, people. Even if we love those people, that's good. I mean, we have families, we have friends. We should enjoy them by all means. Yes? But we, with a sense of measure, with a sense of, okay, I, I, not, I, I, I no, don't need to, to put the burden on one person to make you happy, to put the, uh, the burden to, to your family, to situations, to phenomena, and you say, you will make me happy. No, if, if we say that, then this, this is like, like doing ourselves harm because according to Buddhism and according to the Buddha's teachings and expositions on impermanence, everything is impermanent. Yes, everything is impermanent inside samsara, okay? Right, so then we have the end of suffering or niroda, yes, in the Pali Canon. So the end of suffering is to abandon the cause of suffering, which is desire and attachments. Okay, so it's very easy, no? It's, it's, it's a very simple teaching, but it's quite profound, quite profound. Yeah, so we have suffering, but suffering doesn't come out of the blue. It's not like suffering exists like per se, but it exists because of a cause. If we remove the cause, then we won't have the effect. It's very simple, yes? If you don't, uh, I don't know, if you don't turn like like light fire, then you you won't have like a like a match with the fire. Yes. So the cause of 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 a phenomena is it's very important because the phenomena depends on the cause to exist. If we remove the cause, then we won't have that effect. Okay. So the effect depends on the cause. So what is the end of suffering? If we know that desire to at an attachment to mental states and phenomena causes suffering, so what would be the end of suffering? To remove the cause. So remember, this is very important. And sometimes people misunderstand this. It's not that we need to abandon the people we love. It's not that we need to abandon money uh, or whatever, or to abandon the physical things. It's to abandon our attachment to those things. That is quite different. Because you can go to, I don't know, to, you, you can try to become a, uh, like, I don't know, like a hermit, just and uh, live outside society. But if still your heart is still attached to the things that you, that you are attached to, then you will still suffer, even if you are in the middle of a mountain. Whereas, like many good masters, they live inside cities, maybe very good practitioners. Uh, you, you, you can live in a, in a, maybe in a temple surrounded by a lot of people all the time and your mind can your mind and your heart can be at ease why it's because they they, they understood the third noble truth the third the third noble truth is not saying okay remove the object remove <laughs> remove your family remove your body yes it's not like that 
You can keep your body, you can keep your family, you can keep everything. Yes, the thing you need to remove is not the, the object, but your relationship with the object. So this relationship is a relationship of attachment. So don't be attached. Yes, let, let it go. Yes, if you let go, then you will be able to, uh, to have a normal life, yes, in society. Yes, but you won't be so much attached. Okay, this is very important. Especially for, for lay people. Yes, maybe for a monastic, it's different because they do change their environment. Yes. But all, also for monastics, even, uh, they also have memories from their, from their I don't know, their, their families, lovers and stuff. They are also human beings. So they also need to get detached, not so much from the physical thing, but also from their own memories and their own attachment to things. Uh, and even if you are a monastic, yes, especially, for example, in, I don't know, uh, those big monasteries in, in China or, for example, in India, you are surrounded by people all the time. Yes, So you cannot remove, uh, you know, your, your, your bonds, your link to people. You need to remove is your attachment. That is what you need to remove. So that is the, the, the third noble truth. Then we have the noble eightfold path which is the path that leads to the cessation or to the end of suffering, which is this path. Okay, let me see. Okay, so this is the noble eightfold path. So what is right view? Of course, I, I am not saying that this is the, I don't know, the canonical or the let's say, the, the unique way to interpret the, 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 for, the, the Noble Eightfold Path, because there are many, many, many texts. But maybe according to the, to, to the basic sutras, and maybe in a very simple way, we can summarize a little bit what is the gist, yes, what is the essence of each uh, part of the Noble Eightfold Path. So the Noble Eightfold Path could be compared to, let's say, like a, like a link, a link of... Uh, things that you do yes, with your mind, with your speech, and with your body in order to uh, be liberated from suffering. It has to cultivate your mind, to cultivate your words, your speech, and to cultivate what you do. Remember, those are the three uh, pillars of, the, of your karma. So your karma has three different facets. Uh, the karma of mind, what you think, the karma of what you say, which is related to what you think, and the karma of what you do, which is related to your mind and your and your uh, words, okay? So everything is related, but can be divided into three sections, three ways in which karma can operate. Now, first is right view. What is right view? Yes, is to view the world through the Buddhist basic teachings on the law of cause and effect, rebirth, samsara, the four noble truths, morality, wisdom, compassion, and the potential to attain Buddhahood. So what is this? is to view the world through the point of view of the Buddha Dharma. This is very important because we cannot start the Buddhist path with our own preconceptions and opinions. Yes? Maybe we have some baggage. We have some, like, some memories from our past, I don't know, spiritual uh, adventures, let's say. But when we start the Buddha Dharma, we need to be very clear, very mindful of our beliefs. Yes? What do we believe? Yes, what do, how do we, we view the world? If we view the world through our own attachment, through our own ignorance, then there is no way for us to commence, to start the Buddhist path. We need to at least make the effort to try to look at the world through the lens of the Buddha Dharma. And this is the lens that talks to us about the law of cause and effect, rebirth, the realms in samsara, morality, wisdom, compassion, and the potential to become Buddhas ourselves. Yes, if we view the world through this lens, yes, trying to uh, to to I don't know um, to see the world not just as a as a place to fulfill our mundane desires, but also as a place where we can incarnate, where we can practice the Buddha Dharma and use those situations, yes, through our own mental cultivation for the benefit of ourselves and the benefit of others. That is the right view. Yes, to to to, to view the Dharma. As, uh, as a practice, okay? And also to view the world uh, through the lens of Buddhist wisdom, okay? So we should understand our minds, understand the universe through the lens of the Buddha Dharma. Then if, if we have the right view, and remember this is the first, remember that this, this order, 
It's not random. The Buddha taught that the first thing we need to do is to right view because this is where everything is built upon. It's like building a house. If you build a house and you don't have a strong foundation, then the, the house will, will collapse. Yes? I am telling you this because now my family is building a, a little house in the mountains and we have invested a lot of energy and resources to make sure that those foundations are, are, are very, you know, secure for us because i mean my family is going to live there we, we don't want to, to to die there because it's a mountain yes so this is the same for our dharma practice yes? if we are going to practice the dharma we need to have a strong foundations and those strong foundations are yes right view to have respect for the buddha, buddha dharma to have respect for the buddha dharma enough that we are willing we at least willing yes to leave our preconceptions our ignorance behind okay doesn't matter your own, uh, let's say, uh, preconceptions or uh, pre pre prejudices, like, like your own uh, biases, but you have to take into account the Buddha Dharma and put it above above your, your own opinions because we are unenlightened beings. That is why the Buddha emphasized, at, at, at least at the beginning, humility so much. You need to be humble, yes? Because if you are not humble, then you won't be able to learn anything. It's like, for example, you, you, you want to learn guitar, Yes, you want to learn how to sing or maybe you want to learn piano. If you go to the piano teacher and you say, okay, I already know everything, <laughs> then you won't be able to learn much, isn't it? Yes. Whereas if you go to a teacher and you say, okay, I don't know, please teach me, I respect you. I know, I, I know that the thing I want to learn, the, 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 the person I want to become is you. So please teach me how to become like you. Okay? That is why the first uh, Dharma sharing session was about the life of the Buddha. Yes. And when I look about, uh, uh, when I study, and when we hear about the Buddha's life, uh, we, we should aspire, oh, I want to become like him. He's my example. He's my role model, isn't it? Yes, if you have this view, then you will be able to, to become like the Buddha eventually, if you follow these steps, which are the steps that the Buddha uh, you know, prescribed for us to purify our mind, our words, and our actions. Very good. So we have the right intention is to always act with the spiritual uh, well-being of others and oneself in mind. What is right intention? It's basically before we act, we have an intention. Remember that beings in samsara are not only born in a specific realm of existence due to uh, their actions, but also due to their motivations. For example, if you uh, do maybe you have like let's say a million dollars and you donate uh, to a temple you can donate this money to the temple with a heart of uh, purity with a heart of, uh, of humbleness with a heart of uh, let's say harmony and true devotion but you can also donate the same money and do the same action motivated by greed motivated by fame oh i want to be famous i want to upload i want to upload uh, I'm sorry. Okay. I want to upload um, this photo to, to Facebook, to Instagram, you know, like those people do, you know, like they do something good, maybe, maybe for children, uh, for poor children, whatever. But the first thing they do is not to look at the faces of those they help, but to look at Facebook, you know, to, to put the, 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 their, their, their picture on Instagram and to, to, to remind the world that they are good. Mm. I mean, it's the same million dollars, it's the same, it's the same action, yes, but the motivation is very different and it changes the outcome, okay? If you do something with a pure heart, then the outcome will be different. If you do the same thing with an impure heart, it will change the outcome as well. So the Buddha is telling us, it's not so much about doing the right thing or the bad thing, it's the motivation, yes? The motivation behind the action. So... Even before studying also the Buddha Dharma, if we have right view, we should also have this right view and see the Dharma as an opportunity to help oneself and others. If we study, study the Dharma and we do it like with more motivation of, I don't know, I want to impress people. I want to, I don't know, maybe go to a cocktail party, you know, and impress people with my speech and, and tell them stories about the Buddha so they, they, they admire me. This is not good. This is, this is an impure motivation. What is our motivation? Why do we study the Dharma? We study the Dharma to become a Buddha. We study the Dharma to be liberated from suffering and to liberate others from suffering. 
We study the Dharma because we want to develop infinite compassion and infinite wisdom, and we want to liberate ourselves and others from the cycle of birth and death. Isn't that different? Very different, yes? Because we have right view, right intention. Yes, that, that, that should be our intention. What is right speech? To speak always in harmony with the guidelines of compassion and wisdom taught by the Buddha. So right speech is to, okay, at least from the Hinayana perspective, from the Theravada perspective, is to refrain from uh, evil speech, not to speak vulgar words, not to, to speak bad of others, not to engage in evil, idle chatter, yes, like gossiping, uh, you know, wasting our time with, with words and stuff. This is uh, unskillful speech. But also in Mahayana, we are also encouraged to practice compassion with our words. Yes, Not only from refrain from evil, not only to refrain from evil, but also engaging wholesome and meritorious actions with our speech. What can we do with our speech? We can recite the names of the Buddhas. We can recite Amitofo, recite the name of our Lokiteshvara Bodhisattva. We can speak kind words to others. Yes, and Try to help them with our speech. I mean, the, the voice is a very, very powerful thing. Sometimes people can do more good and more evil with their words and with their, vo with their uh, bodies. I mean, just think about the, the power of the voice, the power of human, human words. Yes, I mean, entire civilizations have been built just on words. Yes, entire empires have been collapsed just by words, just by uh, discourses. Okay, so the power of words cannot be underestimated. What we say to others matters. What we say to ourselves is also a speech. Yes, remember what we say to our minds is also considered speech. It's mental speech. It's not physical, but it is a still speech. Okay, so right speech is very important. We need to have a, a, a mindset, a motivation of wisdom, a motivation of compassion before we speak. If we don't do that, then we can get into trouble. And we can see that for ourselves. I mean, we are not perfect. I know that. I, I know this firsthand. Sometimes I commit mistakes and I know, was my motivation good? When I, when I realized that my motivation was not good, then I say, aha. So it's no wonder that these things happen to me. Okay? So if, if we have right speech, we will be able to motivate others. We will be able to benefit others with our words instead of harming them. Yes, and remember, it's not all. It's not all, only about others, but also about our, our own uh, mental health, our own mental harmony. If we speak kind words to ourselves and to others, we will create harmony within ourselves and outside. Yes, so uh, right speech is very important for our peace of mind and for the peace of mind and happiness of others. Very good. So we have right action it's to do meritorious acts based on morality and virtue, to avoid the 10 negative actions and practice the 10 meritorious actions, okay? So right action is to refrain from all the things, uh, all the evil things we can do with our body, yes? to, to steal, to engage in sexual misconduct, to engage in violence, etc., etc. Here's the 10 negative actions. And engage in the 10 meritorious actions. What, what are the things we can do with our body? Yes, we can... Uh, I don't know. We can provide uh, a lot of good things with our hands. You know, we can caress our loved ones. Yes, we can. I don't know. Uh, like put the, our, our palms in, in the back of someone who needs help. Who is sad. Yes. So our body can be an instrument of compassion. Our uh, actually, our body is like an instrument. Yes, it's like a musical instrument that depends on 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 on, the, on your mind. Depends on your motivation. What you want to do with this instrument. If you want to create harmony, or if you want to create cacophony or disharmony. Okay, so right action is to engage in positive uh, actions. And this is all related. This is all related to the previous thing. If we have right view, if you have right intention and right speech, therefore your actions will be pure. So remember the Buddha was very scientific. Yes, cause and effect. One thing leads to another. Hmm? If we have right view, then you will have right motivation. If you have right motivation, then your words will be pure. If you have good words, then your actions will reflect your mind and your speech. Then, if you have right action, it leads you to the fifth point, right livelihood. What is right livelihood? If you are not a monk or a nun, then you will be able to, you need to make a living, yes? But there are many immoral ways to make a living, like for example, selling alcohol, like selling drugs, 
or maybe weapons, or maybe slavery. There are many, many harmful things you can do as a, li as a living. For example, I don't know, uh, people who, so who work in some industries that have some dubious motivations, okay? Uh, but the Buddha was not, was not like, like telling people to abandon their jobs and stuff. But he was just telling that whatever you do, try to do uh, good. Just try to do something that is beneficial to society. And even if you cannot do that, at least try to do something that, that doesn't harm other living beings. Yes? For example, to earn a living in accordance with Buddhist ethics, not harming or intoxicating the minds or bodies of sentient beings and one's own body and mind. So, for example, the Buddha uh, was not uh, okay with, for example, people who uh, work like, like as a butcher. Yes. He was not saying that the butchers and the people who work, let's say, as a fisherman and stuff are like doomed or stuff. No, he was just saying that doing that has consequences, can be consequences. I mean, it's logical. Everything we do has, has a consequence. If you make a living by killing other beings, uh, maybe you have some opportunity to apply the Dharma in some way. Yes, especially with the info, you have the compassion of all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, but it will be very hard to resonate with the Buddha's heart, okay? So it's good. It's good that you, if you have the opportunity, if you have the chance to abandon a work place or a company that is actually creating harm in the world, you should by all means do so, yes. Uh, so, of course, the Buddha also mentioned slavery. At the time of the Buddha, there was still slavery. Actually, nowadays, there's still slavery, but it's more like not official and stuff, yes. But nevertheless, uh, we have improved a lot in our society nowadays. We don't have like official slavery. But uh, remember that the Buddha was very ahead of his time. Many, many spiritual masters, for example, in, 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 in other parts of the world, they were, um, they taught about marvelous stuff, about morality, or whatever, but they didn't talk about slavery. It's like they were like, agree, agreeing with slavery. But the Buddha was very, very clear in his words. He was not, a, uh, he was not uh, for slavery. He was not for in, uh, injustice. Okay, so the Buddha was very con con conscientious about uh, social responsibilities. Okay, now we have uh, right effort to awaken proper diligence to train one's heart and mind according to the Buddha Dharma. So we need to have good effort to awaken. Uh, you know, a pure desire and a skillful desire, because of course, if we are going to practice the Buddha Dharma, we shouldn't be like fanatical and stuff. And maybe, I don't know, do, don't sleep, don't eat. Maybe this could be harmful for our body. Remember the Buddha, no? In his Buddha, in his life, the Buddha, uh, for, I mean, for the sake of sentient beings, he displayed or he played the part of a person who, who practice, practices foolish practices in order to attain enlightenment like torturing one's body no uh, i mean not sleeping not eating these things are actually very harmful so we should have right effort and right effort is to keep a balance in our life to uh, have a lot of effort yes to know the limits of our body and also to have a, another let's say uh, to be not to be complacent or lazy this is the other extreme the extreme is like you don't do anything that you think that you will become a, a good Buddhist by not practicing, which is a very funny, <laughs> funny thought. You should be able to uh, to improve those those uh, views. Okay, you should be able to to realize that in order to become good at anything, let's say good at I don't know in a, in a sport, let's say soccer or maybe basketball or maybe I don't know in music or in mathematics. You need to be able to practice. You need to practice in order to become good at something. The Dharma is the same. The Dharma is also a transcendental discipline, but a discipline nonetheless. It's a discipline. It is something that you need to uh, practice every day. And the more you practice, naturally, you will become better. Okay? This is something natural. Okay? So have right effort. Right attention is to train one's heart and mind not to be distracted from the Buddhist teachings and way of life during daily life. So to have right attention... Uh, of, co of course, this is related also to Nienfo in Purpulan practitioners to practice Nienfo in our daily lives, to be aware of the Buddha's name. Okay. Uh, also is to have right attention to our own minds and um, uh, our own thoughts and feelings. Okay. To be aware of the things inside our hearts. Yes. This is also right attention. Uh, in some translations of right attention, they also talk about right recollection. What is that? Is to remember the teachings of the Buddha in the proper place. 
is to constantly be like be mindful of the of the dharma of the buddha dharma in our daily lives so we remember oh i shouldn't do this i should do that yes to be to be mindful and to have the buddha's uh, intention and the buddha's teachings in, inside our minds and hearts all the time yes this can also be right attention and this is also right concentration right meditation is to train oneself according to the buddhist teachings on the cultivation of the heart and mind through meditation and other contemplative practices as taught in the buddha dharma so right concentration or meditation is uh, in our case is nianfo yes is to practice recitation of the buddha's name in our daily lives and also in uh, in sessions informal sessions especially according to master jin kuan we should practice uh, once twice a day at least in the morning and then in the evening but we can also practice all day long if you want but we should have uh, proper uh, sessions of practice and of course uh, do not limit ourselves uh, for, to to practice in informal sessions but practicing throughout our days uh, throughout the day uh, in work even even in the bathroom in the toilet we can practice niem for yes right concentration of course this is different for each school so different buddhist schools have different methods for example in in zen they have sasen in vajrayana they have visualizations and rituals in uh, in theravada they have vipassana and shamatha but nevertheless this applies to all buddhist schools all buddhist schools have some level of meditation some style of meditation in our case is niem fo okay uh, I don't know if we, if I should continue. Maybe we have uh, some time, uh, some twenty minutes for Q and A, and then for our next uh, session we will have uh, uh, some something about the twelve links of interdependent. Or <laughs> I'm so sorry, I forgot to to mute myself. Thank you. So uh, so we have uh, the the twelve links of dependent origination is quite um, a profound teaching of the Buddha Dharma because it teaches you how beings uh, from one little mistake then this creates a, a set of mistakes that lead to birth and death. Okay, so it's like a domino effect, you know, like dominoes. So you put one 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 piece of the dominoes, yes, and you move it, and then you complete a whole cycle just by one movement. So just by ignorance. Yes, if, if we don't keep ignorance in check, then ignorance can create formations. What is formations? Are mental formations or mental inclinations based on ignorance. So if we have ignorance and we ignore the Four Noble Truths, then ignorance would lead us to have uh, mental formations based on ignorance. Okay? For example, you have ignorance. So I say, oh, I want a car. Ah, this car will make me happy. Okay? Because, because happiness depends on cars. So this is actually ignorance. This is a form of ignorance. But this ignorance can be actually summarized uh, in, in a very simple way. Conditioned phenomena will provide happiness. Whatever, and fill the blank. I don't know, a plane, uh, uh, marriage, uh, money, whatever. It's conditioned phenomena. It's the same. Yes, It's like, it's like algebra. It's like X, an X variant. Whatever it is, is X. Whatever it is, is this variant of a condition phenomena. So ignorance start here. Okay. So for example, a car will make me happy. Whatever. Then this will create a formation. What is the formation? Is the thought. Yes. Based on those ignorance, and, and then you form a plan. Okay. A plan based on ignorance. Formations are mental formations. Then formations would lead to uh, consciousness. So consciousness will be like a persona, like a persona, uh, like, a, like a mindset based on this ignorance and these formations, okay? So consciousness is not something like, uh, at least not in the concept of the 12 links of dependent origination, it's not something innocent. It's something that is based on a previous mental formation. So if you have these mental formations based on ignorance, then you will be uh, create a uh, consciousness, okay? Then from consciousness, this will create okay, a mind body, okay? So what is mind body? Precisely when you are about to be born, let's say you abandon your physical body, then your ignorance will create formations, then formations will create a mindset or consciousness based on this ignorance, and then you will be born in a specific body that is based on this consciousness and formations. 
That is why our body and our mind are not something that comes out of the blue. It comes from our previous, uh, uh, let's say, ignorance, mental formations and consciousness that was based on an ignorance of the Four Noble Truths. If we understood the Four Noble Truths, we wouldn't be born. We wouldn't be born in samsara at least. We would be in the pure lands. No. So we have this mind-body complex. Then from this mind-body, of course, this is related and this causes the six sense bases. What are the six sense bases? You know, what you smell, uh, what you mind. So mind plus the five senses, no? what you touch, uh, what you taste, etc. So these, these are the six uh, sense bases. Then from these six, six sense bases, there comes contact. So when we have a human body, let's say, I, I, I am doing this, this uh, with an example of the human body, but this can also apply to an animal or to a, a deva or whatever. Okay. But once we have contact with the six ba bases, then we will be able to, uh, if, we, if, if we don't practice the Dharma, of course, but if we don't practice the Dharma, our sense bases will create dust. This is in Mahayana Buddhism called the six dusts. Okay. We will we'll create pollution. Why? Because we, if we contact uh, things, ideas with our mind, if we contact uh, sensations with our body, and these sensations do not lead to wisdom, then this contact would lead to feeling. Yes. Okay. So we'll have feelings based on the things we experience with our body and our mind. And if we continue with our ignorance, this then will cause craving. This is natural, no? If we have a body and we have all of these elements that lead you to, 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 to feel, yes, and this ignorance is still in the link, then the things you will feel according to the contact of your mind and your, and your body, then this will lead to have a feeling of attachment. And this attachment will create a craving. So everything is related. So from feeling, then comes craving, yes? Then you start to desire, to covet, yes, things. So you started with a desire here. Then when you are born inside samsara, then you will start, start to, to crave new things. Yes. And these cravings lead to attachment to those things you crave. Yes. But why do you crave all of these things? Because everything comes from ignorance. Okay. So let's try to review again. So from ignorance, you ignore the four noble truths. Then you have mental formations that lead you to have a persona or a consciousness that seeks to be born in samsara. Then once you are born, you have a mind body. Then from this mind body, you have the six sense bases. Yes, the mind plus the five uh, senses of the physical body. No? Then we have contact, which are the, the, the contact of the objects of the six sense bases, ideas, smells, tastes, uh, all the odor, all odors, etc. So from these contacts, then you will create stories inside your mind. So you will start to have feelings. From these feelings, you will start to have desires for the things we have to have experience in samsara. From these cravings, then you will be attached to those cravings. From these cravings, then you will, once you lose your physical body, you will become and you will repeat the cycle all over again. Yes? With ignorance here, then you will be born again and then you will suffer. Okay? This is a way to interpret the, the 12 links of dependent origination. Okay? I hope it's not too complicated. Of course, this topic is quite deep. No? It's, I think it's one of the most complex topics, uh, at least in, 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 in Theravada Buddhism. This is also spoken in Tibetan Buddhism quite a lot. But there are many philosophical details here that I have omitted. But the thing is that, uh, the, the thing we have to keep in mind is that from ignorance, many bad things happen. <laughs> this could be like a, like a description of what happens here. Yes, from ignorance, we have a lot, uh, these 12 links of dependent origination that lead us to suffering. Okay? It leads us to suffering because it leads us to samsara and to have a new body, a new mind. And from this mind, we will have experiences in samsara that if we don't practice the Dharma, would lead us and to start the cycle all over again. It's like a dog biting its tail. It's like chasing a dog chasing its tail. If we have ignorance and we don't remove ignorance, we will keep committing the same mistakes all over again. Okay. okay. Then I want to finish today's uh, Dharma sharing session 
with this uh, transcendental dependent arising, which is the opposite. The, let's not say the opposite, but is the is the transcendental way to understand twelve or other twelve links that do not lead to samsara like ignorance, but lead to nirvana. Okay. Sometimes people forget this is a very important teaching of the Buddha Dharma. Yes. This have uh, this has caused many people to believe that the Buddha Dharma is negative or pessimistic, but actually the Buddha Dharma is quite optimistic. It's the opposite. It's quite luminous. Why? Because once we understand that, that ignorance causes suffering in all of these uh, links, then we have to understand. Okay, so if there is, if there are twelve links that lead me to suffering, there should be other links. Yes, other links of actions and causes and conditions that lead me to happiness. Isn't it? Yes, it's like the pure land sam samsara. If samsara is caused by ignorance, and there, is, there are complete like universes emanated with ignorance. There should be worlds emanated with wisdom, isn't it? Yes, it's like a musical instrument. If you touch an, a, a piano and the person who is playing doesn't know what to do, yes, you say, okay, this is creating cacophony, but I am pretty sure that this piano can create a very beautiful sound in other hands, yes, in the hands of a master. This is the transcendental dependent arising. So instead of beginning with ignorance, we begin with faith, yes? Faith is very important in Buddhism, but not blind faith, but confidence in the path of the Buddha Dharma. So let's say that you are hearing what I'm telling you. If you awake in faith and you say, oh, I want to be liberated from suffering. I want to attain enlightenment. Then this, this is faith because maybe you don't know all of the details of what of, of the path ahead of you. You don't know all the things there, is to, there, there are to know about the Dharma and neither do I. Yes, I am on, I'm an only a student. So we have still faith in the Buddha Dharma. It's called Sala. Then we have joy, yes, or Pamoya in, in Theravada. So joy, so from faith comes joy. Why? Because if you have faith that suffering can be eliminated and you can be liberated from suffering, then you will feel like joy. You will see, okay, maybe I don't understand everything there is to know about Buddhism, but at least I know from the Buddha's words, from the Buddha's discourse, that there is a way out of suffering, that there is a way to become a Buddha. Yes, that is something that if you really analyze it, causes a lot of joy. Yes, a lot of uh, confidence. Okay, then from joy come rapture. Yes, so when you practice uh, um, meditation as well, for example, you practice uh, Nienfo to a, to a high degree, or may, even in your daily life, you will experience that the name of Amitofo has a lot of... Uh, beauty, a lot of harmony, a lot of power. Uh, even if you practice other forms of meditation in, in the Buddha Dharma, you will begin to have even rapture, not only joy. You will be ecstatic even. You will have this, this quality of, 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 of transcendental joy. Yes. Then from this, uh, from this transcendental joy comes tranquility. Okay. So you will, you, you have, will have tranquility. Why? Because you will be able to understand that everything that happens in the world happens for a reason. Everything that happens to people is not random. It's not chaotic. And it comes from the law of cause and effect. You will understand the law uh, that uh, pervades the universe, which is the law of karma. If we study uh, Buddhism, you will, will have no doubt about the universe and about the nature of your own mind. So all of these things are interrelated. So from tranquility, then comes happiness, which is sukha. Yes. So once we have rapture, tranquility, then you will be happy in your daily life. Okay. Because you will be practicing the Buddha Dharma. And even if you are not perfect, you will realize that everything you learn makes you a better person day by day. Yes. Everything you do, all the, all the time you practice, you know there is a consequence for this. And this consequence is happiness. Then from happiness, then you have also to develop concentration or samadhi. Yes. So once we have happiness, then you will realize that due to faith, due to joy, due to rapture, tranquility and happiness, you will be able to concentrate more because a mind that is happy, a mind that has faith, a mind that has tranquility will be able to concentrate, isn't it? So remember, this is the a link. Yes, it creates one thing leads to another. Yes. Now you have concentration. You will be able to concentrate and to have fewer random thoughts. With, with fewer random thoughts and concentration, then you will have knowledge and vision. Yes. 
Nana Dasana, which according to the to the to the, the teachings in the Pali Canon leads you to knowledge and vision. What is knowledge and vision? Is knowledge and vision of the things the way they are. Okay, so once you have a clear mind, you will be able to see reality as it is without distractions, without ignorance. Yes. So once you have this, you will see reality. And when you see reality the way it is, you will be disenchanted. Yes. Why? Because once you have once you have a clear mind, once you have a, a, a pure heart, you will be able to see reality and you will be able to see that the things that people fight so much about, like money, like, like I don't know, like, like obsession with sex, obsession with fame, obsession with all of these uh, nonsense, th th then you won't covet it. You won't be greedy about it. Why? Because you have all of these things that su to support you that cause true joy, rapture, tranquility, happiness caused by the Buddha Dharma, by your practice of Niemfo, in our case, as pure land Buddhists, then this will lead you to concentration and this concentration will lead you to see things as they really are. And once you see that, you will be able to be disenchanted. And this disenchantment will lead you to this passion or viraga. This passion is the next step. Okay. So when you are disenchanted, it's like, for example, it's like, for example, you're in a restaurant and they give you, ah, I don't want more of this ice cream. I have enough. This is, this, this doesn't taste good at all. You know, when you give like a, a very poor, a cuisine, yes, a very poor dish, yes, and you don't want anything to do with that. Okay, so you first have this disenchantment, then you have this passion or viraga, mm -hmm. then you don't want uh, these things to happen. You don't want, uh, you are not attached to this phenomena. Okay, so disenchantment leads to this passion, which is the opposite of passion. When you are passionate about something, is that you believe it, but when you are dispassionate, you have this skeptical approach. You no longer believe, uh, you know, a phenomena. You no longer believe uh, samsara again. And then, once you have this dispassion, then you will lead. It will you. It will lead you to emancipation, which is nirvana or vimuti. Yes, at least the nirvana of the arahats. So arahats go from these uh, to, uh, eleven links, and this lead the, leads, leads them to emancipation. Yes, because they they follow each of these steps. This is related to a Mahayana doctrine, which is the, the doctrine of the uh, Paramitas. So from generosity, if you are generous, then it, this uh, is the beginning of the path, yes? Then you develop virtue. Then for virtue, then you develop patience. If you are patient, virtuous, and generous, then you will be able to develop diligence, yes, in the Buddha Dharma. From diligence, you will be able to develop meditation, and from meditation, you develop with wisdom. Okay, so everything in the Buddha Dharma is like a concatenation or a, let's say a, um, a union of several causes and conditions. So even the Buddha, even the path of the Buddha Dharma is related to a step by step process. This is what the Buddha is talking uh, to us about in the 12 links. So we have in, in, in reality, let's say here, sorry. We have the 12 links of interdependent origination that leads that lead us uh, inside samsara with ignorance as the, as, the, as the mother of all causes here. And we have transcendental dependent arising, which begins with faith. You see, it's very beautiful here. If we, if we have ignorance and we start with our foolish desires, then it would lead us to samsara again. But if we start with faith, if we start with confidence in the Buddha's teachings, it can lead us even to emancipation. Yes, so we have very different outcomes. On the one hand, we have ignorance that leads to death and suffering, and we have sada or faith that leads us to emancipation through all of these 12 links. Okay, in Mahayana, okay, this is also related to the Buddha Dharma, is we have generosity, okay, have a generous heart, yes, and slowly building bodhicitta in order to develop prajna or transcendental wisdom. Okay. Of course, the, the, the six paramitas is something that we will look at uh, in, in, in future sessions. Okay. All right. So we finish uh, for today, dear friends. Maybe if you have maybe a small question before we finish, that would be okay. 
All right. Uh, I don't know. So if you have some some comment or anything, we, you can tell me, or maybe we can finish for today. I'm it awful. It's okay. All right. So so there are no questions for today. Uh, thank you for for your kind for your kindness. Thank you for coming. Remember, uh, dear friends that uh, we will resume our Dharma Shedding sessions or the eighth session where we will examine a little bit about uh, Buddha nature and we will continue our examination, our exposition of basic Buddhist uh, elements of wisdom. Uh, and eventually, I hope next year, we will start to talk about Amitabha Buddha's Pure Land. And of course, we will devote many sessions to Amitabha Buddha because everything we have studied so far is just like an introduction to, to Mahayana Buddhism. Yes, I hope that next year you will uh, join me to, to study a little bit uh, uh, what Shakyamuni Buddha said about Amitabha Buddha and the Chinese Pure Land School, especially based on Patriarch uh, Jin Kuang's uh, letters. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for joining me. We will see each other uh, on the January the 7th. Yes, the first week of January. I will be uh, away on vacations. I will rest a little bit, but I, I, I wish for all of you, even if you are not <laughs> Christians and stuff, but maybe you are enjoying your holidays, maybe your vacations with family members and stuff. So I I hope that you have, uh, that you rest. I hope that you practice Nienfo. I hope that you have fun with your family and you have uh, a compassionate heart and you have a tranquil mind and you keep studying the, the Buddha Dharma and, and, and join me. Uh, for next year's uh, uh, Dharma sharing session. So uh, thank you everyone. Uh, Namo Amitofu. Uh, Jawan. Mm -hmm. Yes. Jawan, just you said 7th of January, and that's a Friday, 7th of January. Your normal session. Ah, ah sorry, sorry. I, I mean, the week. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, Yala. Uh, the week of the 7th of January. So what, what, what would be Wednesday of that week, uh, uh, Jalan? Sorry. Fifth of January is Wednesday. Ah, sorry. So we will see each other the uh, the fifth of, of of January. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yalan. Yes. Thanks for for the correction. So I'll see each other the fifth of January. Amitofo. Okay. Or I will do a uh, merry transfer. We'll stop the recording. Mm -hmm.